the internet from web to wire. My name is Gunnar Karlsson. I'm a professor at KTH Royal Institute of Technology in Sweden. This is a tutorial in two parts. In this second part, I want to explain how the network functions down to the wires which carry the data. But before doing so, I want to recap the first part and give also some additional detail which might be important here. So we had the setup of a client, my computer and a server. And I wanted to go to a web page at our library from my computer. My computer has an IP address that was given to it when it attached to the local network. And the web page I want to get is given by a uniform research locator, a URL. This is a locator that identifies the web page uniquely over the internet. It consists of a method in red which is HTTP that should be used to fetch the web page, the name of the computer in green. On the computer, the web page is located in the path biblioteket, which means library, and the web page that I'm requesting is index.html, given in yellow here. But the locator does not contain the address of the server in terms of the internet address, where on the internet the server is located. So before using HTTP to fetch the web page, my computer needs to obtain the address of the server. It does so by another program called DNS. It stands for Domain Name System, and it is a service that provides addresses for computer names. So my computer makes a query to the DNS server uh, asking for the IP address of www.kth.se, and the server will respond with that address. Now the client computer can make a connection to the server with HTTP secured here to get the requested page and the server will respond with that page. The communication between the client and the server is supported by a great many communication programs. We refer to these as protocols. We organize protocols in layers. On top are the applications that we use for our communication. So we have here HTTP to get web pages. We have DNS to get IP addresses given computer names. These applications are provided as service by transport protocols. We have two transport protocols, TCP and UDP. And the transport protocols rely on network protocols, in this case the internet protocol, to get data carried from one addressed computer to another addressed computer. HTTP on the client side would like to communicate with the program HTTP on the server side. So it indicates this with a port address, which is 80 for HTTP. TCP will send this message and ask the service of IP to have it forwarded to the addressed computer. So the internet protocol ensure connectivity between all computers across the internet. And it can send packets then destined for the server and with an indication that when the server receives this IP packet, it should be forwarded up to TCP. And TCP in turn sees that the contents of the message is destined for HTTP. This is indicated by the port address and it will forward it up to the HTTP process. Data is carried in packets across the internet. And we need to be reminded of the structure of an internet packet. It's a string of bits which starts with a header and following the header is the payload. The header contains the two addresses of the sender, which is the address starting with 96 here, and the receiver address starting with 130 here. In the version I show here, which is called version 4 of the Internet Protocol, addresses are 32 bits long, or 4 bytes, since a byte is 8 bits. There is also a version 6 with 128 bit long addresses. The header also contains other control information of 12 bytes, and in this information is an indication that the contents of the packet should be forwarded to TCP on the receiving side. And the payload contains all the data used by TCP and the application layer, and it is up to 65,000 bytes of data. In this second part of the tutorial, we need to understand the structure of the IP addresses. They are written as four decimal numbers with periods separating the numbers. But we know what's sent in the network is just bits, 32 bits of address. 
So this is how you can read an address. If we start from the left, we have 96 as a decimal number. This corresponds to 8 bits of the address. And 96 in binary format is 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. And so each decimal number corresponds to 8 bits in the address. The periods are not part of the binary address. They are just there for notation to separate the four numbers. And the decimal form of the address is just so that we can easily write them down in text and in presentations like this one. The leftmost bit is the most significant bit. It corresponds to a value of 2 to the power of 31, which is more than 2 billion. And the rightmost bit is the least significant bit. And it corresponds to a value of 2 to the power of 0, which is 1. Part 2. From net to wire. In the previous part, the internet has just been present as a nebulous cloud. Now we will look into the structure of the internet. But look, when we dive into the cloud, we see that the Internet is composed of many other smaller clouds. These are referred to as autonomous systems, and they correspond to uh, the independent operators and owners of networks. Because the Internet is composed of independent networks that are connected together to create a big functioning network. This is apparent from the name Internet, which is similar to international, where you have trade and, and communication among uh, nations, and here you have communication among networks. One network owner can have one or several autonomous systems. The, the, the autonomous systems can be connected bilaterally, directly to one another, or they can make peering agreements with their internet exchange points. Some autonomous systems are stub networks, they are only connected to the Internet in order to uh, send traffic to other ASS and to receive traffic from them. While other autonomous systems, such as this one, will both send and receive data for the computers connected in this autonomous system, but they al it's also willing to transfer data that goes across the network to others. So, for instance, AS224 could, for instance, use 1653 in order to reach AS316. So, how does this communication across the autonomous system function? So, the function to find a path across a network is referred to as routing. And among the autonomous system, this is done by policy. Since there are different network owners, they do not want to show how their network is composed inside. That's what we draw the, That's why we draw them as clouds here. So we look at AS1653 here. It will announce to its neighbors that all addresses that start with 130 to 37 are reachable in this AS. So this is how it's indicated here. The, the dash 16 means that the, the, the most significant 16 bits should be 130 to 37, and for that they should send it to itself as AS1653. Similarly, we have AS316, which announces that all addresses, whether 22 most significant bits correspond to 51, 14, 80, should be forwarded to it, and it gives its own number. Since AS1653 is willing to forward traffic to other ASs, it will announce the network from 316 to, to its neighbors. And they are also transit networks, so they will in turn announce that the addresses that correspond to AS316 can be forwarded through them. So you see a path here that the data can be forwarded to 37 and then AS1653 in order to reach AS316. And there is also a second path where the same addresses could be routed via AS224-1653 to reach AS316. So which of these two possible paths should be chosen by, say, Autonomous System 312? This is determined by policy, because we have these two alternatives, the yellow path and the, the green path. And the policies could be anything. It could be the cost that uh, an autonomous system has to pay its peering neighbor in order to transfer the traffic. 
or it can be um, reliability that an AES has a poor record of, of delivering data. Or the policy could relate to um, security, where an AES simply is not trusted to forward traffic for a certain organization. So let's say here that AES-224 is not trusted here by AES-312, so therefore it will select the path that goes via AES-37 instead, in order to forward data towards AES-316. So that's the routing on the top layer of the Internet, between the various networks that together form the Internet. If we now dive into the cloud of an AES, we actually see something that looks like a network, composed of nodes and links. The nodes are the entities which decide in what direction an IP packet should be sent, and the links are the cables that carry the data between the nodes. The nodes have two layers of communication programs, the Internet Protocol and Data Link Protocols, and there could be many different types of data links. You can imagine that you need a different data link to go across the Atlantic compared to going across a campus or within a building or even within a room or an apartment. So there are data links of many different sorts. Also the AS has a structure of its network with a core and access networks. So this particular AS here, 1653, corresponds to the Swedish University network. And the access network corresponds to the campus networks of the various universities that are connected to the SUNET. The access networks share the 16 most significant bits with the AS. And then they have some bits which distinguish the access networks within that AS. In this case, there was an access network which is distinguished by 44 in the third byte of the address. And it's at the access networks that the computers are connected and they obtain IP addresses that are within the address range of each access network. So next we want to see how the routing is done within an AS. So we can add another access network with a computer and see how these two can communicate across these nodes and these links. The routing here is not by policy. Instead we want to route by the least cost to carry packets between addressed computers. The selection of the cost is uh, set by the operator. Could for instance be the number of links. In that case, a route with fewer links has a lower cost than, than a route with more links. Can also be the delay, the time it takes to go from one computer to the other computer, where a long link would give a long delay and therefore the routing for the least cost would correspond to faster routes than slower routes. We might also want to use links which have a high capacity, so say a 1 gigabit link instead of a 100 megabit link. In that case we can select the cost to be 1 divided by the capacity, which means that as the capacity is bigger, the cost gets smaller. But the choice of the cost is done by the network operator. And different operators for different autonomous systems will have different choices. But it's consistent within one autonomous system. So we see here that there is a path of four links across the core network of autonomous system between the two access networks. Or a path of five links across the core. Which of these will be chosen depends then on the cost structure that the operator has chosen. So given that the network can compute the best routes in the network, we now need the nodes to implement these choices. Meaning that uh, a packet sent from the computer here on the left should be routed following the green route so that it's received by the computer on the right. That means that we need to look at the internal structure of the node. What does a node do with the IP packets that it receives? In the internet, the nodes are usually referred to as routers. And I draw a node here with five input and output links. On input 2, 
it receives an IP packet. This is the same packet that we saw before. At the input it has a forwarding table, which will be consulted in order to decide to which output the packet should be sent. The destination address will be compared to the entries of the forwarding table. And here the X's would match any number of the address. So for the four entries that we have here, the lowest would match any number because there are four X's. Then we have an entry starting with 128, which does not match the destination address, which starts with 130. Then we have an entry with 130 and then two unspecified bytes. So it matches, of course, the destination, which also starts with 130. And then we have an entry which starts with 130 and 237 with two unspecified bytes. And of course, it matches also the destination address with 130 and 237. So we have three matches. So the question is, which of these three matching entries of the table should the router select? Note here also that depending on the choice, the packet would be sent out on either port 1, 4 or 5. The rule here used by the router is that when there are more than one match, it should use the longest matching entry in the forwarding table, which is the top here, which specifies two bytes of the address that match the destination address, which is longer than the second entry, which is only one byte, or the last, which has a length of zero matching bytes. And therefore, the packet will be sent out on port 5 of the router. Now I've shown how the routers decide how a packet should be forwarded from an input to an output, based on the forwarding table. When the packet goes out on a port, it will be transported by a communication link or a data link. Here, all the bits of the packet will be sent out, starting with the header and then the payload. So the question is, how can these bits be carried over a communication link? There are many different data links, and I want to show you two examples. For short distances, it's common to have a pair cable, also referred as twisted pair cable. This is a cable for electric signals so that the zeros and the ones can be represented by positive and negative voltages, respectively, that travel across the cable. For longer distances, we rely on optical cables. And here, a one can be represented by a light pulse, and a zero be represented by absence of a light pulse. Although I call this tutorial from web to wire, I also want to include how a wireless link works. The wireless networks are access networks, so they connect computers to the network. So we have the node and the link. So let me use Wi-Fi, a wireless local area network, as an example. The node here is called an access point, and it sends radio signals toward the computer. And the computer can, of course, send data by radio signals back to the access point. There can be more than one computer within the range of the access point. And they are separated by the physical identifiers that the computer has given to them by the manufacturers. So the two computers here have different identifiers. These are 48-bit identifiers that are written in what's called a hexadecimal number. The IP packet that's sent out on a data link is put in a data link frame. The physical identifiers are put as sender and receiver addresses in the frame header. So this is how the two computers can know whether they should receive a frame or not. If they see their own physical identifier in the receiver field, then they will receive the frame. Otherwise, they will ignore it. There can be more than one access point within reach of a computer, and the computer needs to decide to which one it will associate if it's allowed to connect to both of them. It can also be that they disturb one another because they send in the same range of radio frequencies. Wi-Fi operates in microwave frequencies that are reserved for industrial, scientific, and medical use, 
which means there could be equipment for which this ISM band was defined that disturbed the Wi-Fi. A common example from homes and offices is microwave ovens, which leak a little bit of microwave radiation that can disturb the Wi-Fi network. So let me summarize how data can cross the internet. The internet consists of networks from many different owners. They are referred to as autonomous systems. The routing across the autonomous systems is based on policy. Inside an autonomous system, there is a structure of nodes and links, and the network also is organized into a core and access networks, where the computers that communicate are connected. The network itself is composed of nodes that we refer to as routers and data links. And the routing within an autonomous system is based on the least cost, where the operator has decided what is the cost structure that they want to use. Could be the number of links, or could be the delay of the links, or could be one divided by the capacity of the links. The routers, the nodes in the internet, forward the packets based on the best matching of the destination address to entries of a forwarding table. And the packets are carried across the links by electric, light or radio signals from one node to the other. So with this tutorial in two parts, I hope I have conveyed how web services are provided across an internet by means of many different communication protocols from the application layer down to the data link layer.